do me a favor and flip on over to Luke uh, 14. Didn't catch that, did you? Luke 9, 57, 62. Luke 9, 57, 62. It's a beautiful day to be inside, and we're thankful that you're with us this morning. I got an alert on my phone after I got up, so I checked it, and it said hot and hazy today. And I thought, well, tell me something new. Um, I try to ride 100 kilometers on Friday and Saturday. Um, and Friday, I went through four big balls of Gatorade, and I had to stop over at NASA Road 1, El Lago, I think I was about there, and uh, run a gas station and get two great big more bottles. And uh, got 69 miles in, but uh, boy, I was, I was drinking uh, Gatorade up a storm. And it's, it's good. Uh, to be together and, and to see you here. Um, I, I know that some of you think that I'm too skinny and that I work out too much. I, I know, Tam. I, I know. But let me tell you, a few years ago, I was a mess. I, I was well over 300 pounds and uh, my blood pressure and my blood sugar, I mean, I was almost a diabetic. Uh, it, it, I, I was a mess, and that was on top of the walking issues from dystonia. So, so I started dieting and exercising, and doing a program where I can eat anything I want in moderation, and I love that. I mean, if I want pizza, if I want ice cream, if I want whatever it is, I can have it. And I've lost a good bit of weight, and, and, and look, this past week, I swam 10.10 miles, and I rode 261 miles, and yes, that's a lot. I get up at 4, get my coffee, go to the gym, and I swim, and I come and do my work, and then I'll go home, and I'll lift weights. I hate that part of it, uh, and then I'll go ride my bike, and I saw a neurologist few weeks ago, just to, you know, establish neurological care here, just, just, just in case. And he said there was, according to clinical notes from the last guy, a little bit of progression, and he said the best thing to do was to keep exercising four hours a day to keep walking. Um, and so, guess what I do? Uh, I exercise about four hours a day, and my walking's pretty good. Now, I've had to make a lot of sacrifices. There's times that I don't really want to go out in that heat and ride the bike. I mean, I enjoy riding the bike, but when it's hot, and it's hot, it's difficult to go out than to ride. Sometimes there's something I'd much rather do than do something like that. Sometimes there's food that I really want to have and I just can't. And I've loosened up on the food side of things a little bit now, but still, sometimes I want something and then I just know that I can't have it. You understand that, that sacrifice is just a way of life. You've made plenty of sacrifices too throughout the years. Maybe you're a diabetic and you can't have any and everything you want to eat. Maybe you went to night school, get a degree to progress in your career. Maybe you worked some overtime, put the kids through college. Maybe you uh, put some money every month in an IRA to prepare for retirement sacrifices. Life is about choices. And life is about sacrificing and making good choices versus bad choices. Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. 
encountered three men. Three men who said they would follow him. They were interested. They wanted to be disciples. But they weren't willing to sacrifice. They were not willing to put forth any type of effort to serve Jesus. And Jesus made clear in Luke 5 that following Jesus requires sacrifice. Following Jesus requires sacrifice. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to make sacrifices. There is no way around it. That's what the Lord taught us in Luke 9, 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, in ancient Judaism, that's the normal course of events. Typically, teachers did not call their own disciples. Jesus was different. Jesus called his disciples. But more often than not, in ancient Judaism, someone would find a teacher that he wanted to study under and go and say, I, I, I want to be your disciple. And so this man comes to Jesus and says, I want to be a disciple. I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus would have accepted this guy as a disciple, but the man had a heart problem. Jesus knew that. And Jesus said to him, verse 59, or rather 58, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus had sacrificed. He had sacrificed the comforts of home to go and preach. And he told this man, if you're my disciple, you're going to have to sacrifice the comforts of home. Jesus said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Folks, that is not metaphorical there. It's literal. Back up to the previous paragraph. Jesus was in a Samaritan village. They rejected him. He found nowhere, literally nowhere, to lay his head. He didn't have a place to sleep. He never knew whether or not he would find a place to sleep. He told the man, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, follow me. He's calling a disciple. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me first go and bury my father. Apparently, this man was the eldest son. I say that because burying the father was, in ancient Judaism, the most important job the eldest son had. It took precedence over everything else. It took precedence over circumcision. It took precedence over obeying the law. It took precedence over studying the law. It took precedence over service in the temple. It took precedence over everything. Now, understand the way Jews buried the dead. If someone died, you buried the corpse the same day. Jesus, they buried him the same day. That, that's what you did with the corpse. You buried it the same day. A year later, after all the flesh had rotted off the bones, the eldest son would return and take those bones and place them in a special box 
what's today called an ossuary, place them in that box, and then place that box in a special slot in the tomb. This man may be asking for delay of a year. He may have be saying, Jesus, my dad just died. I need to wait a year till all his flesh rots away and I can place him in the box and put him in the tomb in the proper place. Give me a year and then I'll follow you. You know the other possibility? Dad's still alive. And this man is asking for an indefinite delay in following Jesus. Jesus, I will follow you sometime. But let's wait till dad dies. And then give me another year until I can put his bones in the ossuary and put it in the tomb. And then, then, I will come and follow you. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, if you go and read the sermon online, I, I, I say that Jesus is talking spiritually here. Let the spiritually dead bury the dead. I, I don't know if that's the case or not. Jesus may have been being quite sarcastic. And said, so, oh, just, just let things take care of themselves. Let the dead take care of that. It's not as important as following me, in other words. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. The man had a task before him. Jimmy, he had a gift. Jesus found the gift, and Jesus told him what his gift was and how he was to use it. Go proclaim the kingdom of God. Don't wait around and bury your father. Leave that to somebody else. It's not as important as you make it out to be. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't worry about your family. Don't say you're going to follow me and then go back to family. Not going to work that way. Don't look back. In other words, Jesus said, Look, buddy, if you're going to follow me, follow me. Follow me. Don't go back. Do it now. Do it with urgency. What you need to do, Jesus said to this man, is more urgent more urgent than going back and saying goodbye to family. Follow me. Sacrifice your family. Follow me. Brothers and sisters, following Jesus requires sacrifice. I know when we talk to people about becoming Christians, we love to talk about God's grace, how God can and God will remove every sin and every stain. You know that He will. You know that He does for those in Christ. We love to talk about the glories of heaven and being able to see our Lord face to face and what a day that is going to be. But there is a flip side of becoming a Christian and one that we need to think about this morning. And that is that becoming a Christian Following Jesus 
requires sacrifice. Just like you can't eat everything you want on a diet, you can't live however you want and follow Jesus. It doesn't work. How do you sacrifice to follow Jesus? Well, I'm going to submit to you this morning that we follow the narrative here in Luke 9. And we think about sacrificing for Jesus the same way that he told these men to sacrifice for him. How do you sacrifice Jesus first? To follow Jesus, you sacrifice your finances. <coughs> Boy, am I going to be popular this morning. But to follow Jesus, you sacrifice your finances. What did the first man want? He wanted the comforts of this world. He wanted stuff. He wanted things. What did Jesus tell him? Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus told this man, you got to get rid of the comforts of life if you're going to follow me. This man literally had to do that. If he were to follow Jesus... He had to understand he wasn't necessarily going to have a place to sleep. He wasn't necessarily going to have a place to get in out of the rain. He wasn't necessarily going to have a place to get out of the, of the hot and get a nice glass of cold iced tea. This man may not have all the comforts of life. He was going to have to sacrifice them. He was going to have to give them up. And I submit that to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to sacrifice finances. You have to give up the things in this world. There's nothing wrong, you understand, with the things of this world in and of themselves. But when they have a hold on your soul, and that's another thing altogether. And that's what we're talking about. Jesus often taught that one had to sacrifice the things of this world to follow him. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Don't put your trust in stuff. Put your trust in God. A rich young man came to Jesus. And his stuff had a hold on his soul. I mean, this is a man whose stuff had him hooked. You know, he was attached to it. He was married to it. He was bound to it. And Jesus saw his heart. And Jesus saw how much he valued his stuff. And because he valued his stuff so much, Jesus said, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And I don't know that Jesus was speaking hyperbolically there. I don't know that he was exaggerating. He may have literally been saying, man, you are in such desperate shape. Stuff has penetrated your heart, your soul so much. Go get rid of everything. Give it to the poor. Then come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come be my disciple. Come follow me. 
and give up the things of this world. Remember how Jesus was in the treasury. People were coming and putting great sums of money in and, and the collection boxes in the treasury were shaped like horns. And of course, they didn't have checks and things in that day and you put currency in and the way the boxes were made it would amplify the sound and so you could tell how much people were putting in by the sounds it made. People putting in great sums of money. Here comes a poor widow who puts in two mites. All she has to live on. All she has to live on. And Jesus said that she who put in this little bitty old insignificant amount of money Nothing, nothing. The cause was all she had because she loved the kingdom and she gave. Jesus said she put in more than anybody else. Brothers and sisters, you need to sacrifice your finances and follow Jesus. How much are you willing to sacrifice the things of this world to follow the Lord? How faithful are you in contributing to the work of the church here? What about when the children's homes ask for donations? What about when a neighbor is in need? What about when there's a missionary who's doing good work and needs some support? What about so many other opportunities to give? How giving are we? How much do we sacrifice? How much the things of this world have a hold on our hearts. You must sacrifice financially to follow Jesus. Second, to follow Jesus, you have to sacrifice your future. You have to sacrifice your future. The second man had his plans. He had all his ducks in a row. Jesus, I'm going to bury my father. You know, maybe it's going to take a year. It's going to be when he's dead, and, and he, you know, he's dead already, and he's rotting in the tomb. And so when he's fully rotted, and all the flesh is gone, I'll take the bones, put it in the box, and take care of him. Ducks in a row. Or, it may have been Dad's still living. And so, you know, I've got to wait around. When Dad dies, I'll put him in the tomb. Then when he rots, I'll take the bones and I'll take care of them. Had his plans. And Jesus said, forget about it. Forget about your future. Come, follow me. The Lord God has a long history of changing people's futures. Abraham, an idolater in Ur of Chaldea, a rich man. And God says, leave it all and go to land that I'll show you. David, good shepherd, content to be a shepherd. Thank Gary sheep. God tells Samuel, go anoint him king. Change his life, change his future. Andrew, Peter, James, and John were making a good living as fishermen. Good living. They had servants. Brothers and sisters, they had servants. 
These weren't little old fishermen. These were folks who were doing decent business. And Jesus came and said, follow me. Leave it. Leave your business. Leave the servants. Leave your father. Sons of Zebedee left their father there in the boat and they just walked on. Just left it all. And followed Jesus. Their futures, their lives would never be the same. Why well, think about it. Andrew, James, and Peter would all die martyrs' death. Boy, they could have stayed fishermen and had a nice life. Jesus comes along and he changes their future. Changes their lives. Saul of Tarsus, thrilled to be persecuting the church, doing a good job of it too. And Jesus says, You're going to be an apostle and Gentile. Change your future. How much are you amenable to God's future plans for you? Okay, let, 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 let's think about this for a second. How much, in other words, is your life oriented around the Lord Jesus? You see, here's the point. Jesus needs to be the core of your life. Doesn't need to be first in your life. I hate to hear that. He needs to be the core, the center. He needs to be your life. Not... First in a list of priorities. He, he needs to be everything. Everything. So the question comes. You're sitting down to dinner. Somebody calls and needs urgent help. Do you change your plans and serve the Lord? You've, you're tired. You realize you haven't spent time with God that day in prayer or scripture reading or anything. It's time for your favorite TV show. You watch the TV, you spend time with God. You see how oriented is your life around the Lord Jesus. He changed people's future. And he called them to follow him. How much are we allowing our ducks to stay in a row when there's service opportunities? When there's time to serve the Lord? Are we willing to drop everything, change our plans, and serve the Lord? Uh, you understand, there's nothing wrong with uh, you know, go the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways, be wise. She, she gathers food for the harvest. You know, Solomon there, by inspiration, saying plan. Nothing wrong with planning. But there's everything with leaving God out of the planning. And being unwilling to change our plans when God changes the plans. See, everything you do, every plan you make has to have Jesus at the core. Let me ask you this question. When you go on vacation, what do you plan to do on Sunday morning? The beach or worship? Where are your priorities? Is your priority with the Lord Jesus? Is He everything? Is He everything in your life and is your life oriented around Him? And does He take precedence over everything you have planned and everything you want to do? Colossians 317. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything, everything in the name of the Lord 
Jesus. Everything. Everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what it means to allow Jesus to change your future. To sacrifice your future for Him. To allow Him to be everything. And to do everything in His name, under His Lordship, by His authority, as He would will. Will you sacrifice your future for Jesus? But you also must sacrifice your family to follow Jesus. You must sacrifice your family. Third man comes. Jesus, I'll follow you. But let me first go home and tell my family goodbye. And Jesus said, No, man. It's too urgent. You don't have time. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus expected this man to place discipleship above family. And the Lord Jesus expects the same thing from you. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can not be my disciple. Those are the words of Jesus. If you come to me, I've got to be first by a long shot. You have to love me so much it's like you hate everybody else. Ironically, when you love Jesus that much, you love everybody else that much. Um, but yet Jesus said, if you come to me, you've got to hate your family. Your family has to be secondary. I have to be first. And one of the things I love about our Lord, I really do, He never, ever asked you or me to do anything He Himself did not do or would be unwilling to do. Jesus did this with His family. Jesus put God above his family over and over and over. Do you remember when he was 12? Dad and mom took him to Passover in Jerusalem. While well, they're headed back to Nazareth, and where's Jesus? Well, he's in Jerusalem, being about his father's business, where he ought to be. Mary and Jesus' brothers come to see Jesus. Why, you would think that Jesus would go out and see his mama. That's the right thing to do, right? I mean, I woke up last night and realized that Will's plane was leaving. I got up and went and saw Will. That's what you do. Not Jesus. Jesus said, nah. I don't care they're out there. I'm staying here and I'm going to teach. Because whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sisters. God came first to Jesus. Family came second. What about with you? You see... If your spouse does wrong, you still do right. If your children leave the faith, you still stand firm. If family shows up on Sunday morning right before worship, you still come to the assembly and honor God. 
If a family member lives in sin, you, you, you don't condone the sin. You don't support the sin. You put God first. God comes before family. I know that is not easy. Trust me. I know that is not easy. But that's the word of the Lord. To sacrifice family for Jesus. Three men come to Jesus. Willing to follow. One needs to sacrifice his finances. One needs to sacrifice his future. And another needs to sacrifice his family. What is it that you need to sacrifice this morning? What's keeping you from serving Jesus with everything you have? Finances? Family? Future? Something else? If the narrative were written today and Jesus were here and, and you said, Lord, I'll follow you, would He look at you and say there's something amiss? There's something lacking. Are you following Jesus with everything? Uh, the Lord asks us to make great sacrifices. Sacrifices that are not easy. But in Justin's brain, when, when, when I think about this, it becomes easier when you realize what Jesus has sacrificed for me. He left the comfort of heaven, the glory of that eternal abode, to come to this poor world of sickness and death, and sorrow and sin, to live among men, to teach men who are hard hearted, to be betrayed. To go to Gethsemane alone and pray and to beg his father for another way. To die on that cruel rugged cross. To be mocked even as he was dying. Oh, he saved others. Let him save himself. He is the Son of God. To endure all that. Because I'm a sinner. He sacrificed more than he's asking you to sacrifice. He sacrificed far more than you can ever fathom. And he's asking you in comparison to make an itty bitty teeny tiny sacrifice compared to what he did. This morning, do you need to sacrifice to follow Jesus? If you need to come, would you come right now? Understand, sing.